Dajia hao. Thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, it's it's uh, really wonderful to be here. I was joking with my wife when I went out the door this morning that I might bring an extra set of clothes in case I had any tomatoes or eggs hurled at me by uh, by my colleagues who have been waiting for to take a shot for a while. Um, um, the book is is uh, quite controversial. Uh, it's uh, part of the reason that I decided to write the book. Frankly, was you know I had been working in this field, uh, looking at China's. Uh, defense modernization for some time and, uh, and I realized that uh, my assessment, my views of what the United States should do were quite different than most people I was interacting with certainly in the national security community and so I thought to myself you know well maybe I have something unique here to say. Uh, by the way there are, there are several chairs up front if you guys, uh, if, if people want to join us here but uh, so that's really the, the origins of the book. I, I feel very strongly that um, Naval War College is at its best and, and in general um, you know, our, our academic environment is strongest when we have uh, dissonant views, when we have debates, uh, when we, when we uh, argue and debate to make our policy better. Uh, so I think that uh, I'm, part of writing the book was to bring a kind of different perspective, a new way of thinking about it. Uh, and by the way, I, I, I very much enjoy uh, debate and discussion, especially with such a knowledgeable group. So by all means, uh, after I, uh, I finish showing some, some pretty pictures, let's let's engage in some, some uh, dynamic uh, discussion. Um, maybe start off with some uh, current events. You see this picture here. Um, it's not a picture, it's actually a, a Chinese uh, painting, if you will, not in the traditional style. But uh, any pilots in the room, of course, will uh, quickly uh, gather that that is a very unusual way to uh, operate aircraft, certainly during peacetime. Uh, you know, and what is extremely disturbing, you probably guessed already, that, that this um, graphic depicts an uh, actual set of events, uh, probably in August 2014, interaction between a uh, Chinese interceptor and our own uh, P-8 uh, surveillance aircraft. So um, a part of my message here is, and I think this audience knows it well, is that this kind of interaction is going on, um, if not every day, it's going on quite frequently. I think uh, according to the New York Times, there were about five uh, incidents like this in 2015. So it's quite troubling. Uh, and I think we, e even if, if such incidents generally are not in the headlines all the time, we certainly, uh, as uh, you know, retirees, practitioners, strategists who think about these things, we need to reflect deeply on the meaning of these events and uh, certainly what it means for our national security. Uh, well, let me share one other piece of uh, uh, t uh, related event ripped from the headlines, and that is, which I think puts a, a good context, develops a context for this discussion is, uh, by the way, you can, of course, we can find China headlines no matter where we go, practically on every uh, page of the newspaper at this point. Uh, that's how, what a big issue we're dealing with today. But uh, reflect for a minute on the meaning of um, the president of Taiwan, Ma Ying-jeou, uh, and uh, the president of China, who they will meet for the first time uh, ever in, I think, two days. So that, that is a really historic event. Uh, it's actually quite in keeping with the kind of um, reconciliations that I'm arguing for. And we can talk more about the Taiwan situation. I see uh, Professor Rode here, my, my good friend, who's just back from a summer in Taiwan. So I, I might kick questions to uh, Grant over there. But um, these, these are in some, as we consider the Taiwan issue, and if you think the Taiwan issue has been important to U.S.-China relations, you are very correct in thinking that. Uh, these are quite historic times for considering that relationship. But let me uh, push ahead here and uh, we'll see if we can get around to um, touch on a whole variety of issues because this relationship is complex. <coughs> now, I think this crowd um, maybe will like this slide best of all. <laughs> um, this is, this is most of how I spend my time. Just a little background here. I, I, I really, uh, since I came to work, Naval War College 15 years ago, I've been, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of in training as a naval analyst and I spent a lot of time looking at pictures like this. And uh, a key part of the China Institute that I helped set up, uh, a key aspect of that is looking at what the Chinese are saying about their own naval development and trying to understand it and give insights. And I'm sending, uh, basically one email a week down to OPNAV and other places in the Navy sharing information like this uh, that they wouldn't necessarily get from other means. So, and by the way, I encourage all of you to come by and visit our institute and you can see for yourself, just, you know, you, you don't have to uh, speak Chinese to understand a lot of this graphic. By the way, I point out, you know, for example, the uh, propulsor we think that's on their new, uh, their, their new uh, SSN, 
Uh, one other thing we're really worried about actually is this talks about the, um, a, uh, the uh, YJ-18 missile. Uh, it's quite an impressive missile. It has a, um, a supersonic uh, sprint vehicle and uh, you probably know that we don't, our submarines don't fire a, a supersonic ASKIM. So, uh, you know, I'm pointing out to people and it's part of our background here that, that uh, China has um, gone ahead in a few areas of military development and that's something to keep in mind. Uh, not all areas, there are plenty of areas where we're ahead, even far ahead, you know, submarine quieting, for example, but we want to keep that in mind as we, uh, as we consider this relationship. So, uh, the naval analyst at Naval War College decides to uh, play, uh, as it were, in the, in the big strategic questions, and indeed, uh, I, I thought after, you know, about 12 years of working in this area that I should, uh, you know, I'll, I'll uh, dip my toes in the, on the big, in, in the, uh, in the, on the big questions. So, it starts, of course, from a um, where is this debate going in our country? And, and here, these are two books in particular that I see as the bookends of the debate. Uh, and I'll say, um, so if, if this debate is of great interest to you, please uh, read these books. I, I advise you maybe even to read them more than once, as I have. Um, now, this one, by the way, was written by my PhD advisor, <laughs> Aaron Friedberg, uh, at Princeton. Um, and uh, it's a very uh, strong argument for why we should be extremely concerned about China and uh, we have to take, you know, as it were, mobilize for a kind of new Cold War that could become a hot war. Uh, and Hugh White makes kind of the opposite argument in the China Choice where he says, uh, no, actually, we, we, uh, we, we really need to concentrate on sharing power with China and that's the way to go. Now, you can understand from my title, I'm sure, which way I lean in this debate. Um, but I, I fully understand you need to engage with both sides and I've done so and I'm, I'm quite well acquainted both with Friedberg's thinking and, and people who think like Friedberg and uh, by the way in, in my you know intellect you, you may wonder well how is it as a student of Friedberg you've, you've challenged him and I would say in, in the intellectual tradition that I'm that I was brought up in you know that it's quite an honor to your to your teacher if you challenge them so um, you know you can, you can uh, make up your own mind on that Although I'm still in touch with uh, Professor Friedberg, we talk. Oh, sorry. Let's see. I don't want to mess this up here. Let's go with this. Oh. Press the wrong button. Where's John here? I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not good at these things, John. Okay. It's nine o'clock. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Nine o'clock. All right. I think we advanced too many though. Oh, no, that's good. Okay, so um, what, what is unique about this book? Uh, there are lots of China books. You know, you probably have a shelf full already. You know, as you go through the train station, you might see, uh, for example, a book by Henry Paulson, for example. That's the one in, in the train station, the airports now. It says it's the title of something like How to Deal with China. You know, more straightforward than mine, I guess. Um, but, you know, I'm frustrated by these kind of books because if you, you read through them and you come to the end and you say, okay, well, what do we do about it? And there's very little there. Uh, by the way, Paulson's book, very good. I mean, he met with Xi Jinping, he knows Hu Jintao. I mean, th it's worth reading these books. But what to do about China? You know, that, that's the question. And you, you kind of come to the end and you find these very anodyne descriptions, you know, uh, uh, you know, give China a seat at the table or, you know, try to be smart about China, you know. I mean, it's so vague that the, you can't really deal with those. I mean, they're not that helpful in my view. So in this book, what I've tried to do is spell out very clearly what are the steps that need to be taken, not just by the United States, but also by China. In fact, the idea is this, uh, as you can see, is this cooperation spiral. Uh, and these principles that kind of underlie the spirals are, are fairly, uh, I think, intuitive to grasp. Um, but, you know, my general idea is I see, what I see is a kind of escalation spiral. That is, you know, we do something, then they respond, then we do something. Uh, I want to reverse that spiral, go in the opposite direction and look for ways that we can, uh, you know, reach uh, cooperation. But I understand you can't just kind of leap into some great, you know, grand bargain. I don't think that is going to work. We got to build some trust first, first and, and trust is sorely lacking in the relationship. So it requires kind of small steps to start with that would um, take us somewhere uh, more significant. Um, one other thing I'll say is the sourcing in the book, I think, is I'm quite proud of. Uh, we've done, uh, uh, you know, there's some uh, hundreds of articles, Chinese articles, Chinese language articles cited in the book. Look at the footnotes for yourself. Um, and 
to find those hundreds of articles that I cited, I had to go through thousands of articles, okay? So, I mean, it, it's a pretty a wide effort. And by the way, you know, when you look through the China books that are out there, you'd be surprised how little, um, how to put it, uh, people are not doing their spade work uh, the way they should be. Uh, so part of the idea of the project is, you know, we've got to take Chinese voices seriously. We've got to see what they're saying because, after all, how can we think about compromising with them if we don't fully understand their point of view? What are they proposing, for example? And my book, uh, I try to kind of um, push the boundaries of knowledge on their, um, their outlook. And I use a very wide uh, um, a group of sources. So um, now, uh, the, uh, I put in a few extra slides here about the military balance because I feel like this group uh, in particular would be very interested in military questions. So uh, although by, you know, I have to say the book is mostly about diplomacy actually. So maybe I'll dispense with the jacket if, if you'll permit. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, an animated speaker, so I'll, I'll be sweating by the end. <laughs> but, um, all right, so now um, as we look at the military balance, I don't really follow the, uh, the Army side too carefully, as you'd expect. I work at Naval War College, but uh, there is a lot going on there. And um, there's a famous professor, a China specialist at um, Boston College named Robert Ross, and, and he actually wrote a wonderful article where he called it, he called it the geography of peace. He said, look, China is a land power and the United States is a sea power, so they kind of respect each other's spheres and everything should be, uh, should turn out fine. But of course, you know, we know that China, although it has been doing a lot in this area, but they, um, of course, we see a lot in the air and naval realm as well. And, and one thing you can see, if you come into our library and look at our Chinese sources, you'll see that a, this kind of top gun culture uh, is very much uh, in full flower in Beijing. Uh, you get a little taste of it in this photograph, but um, so, and, and of course, the area that I spend the most time, I, I spend a lot of time looking at Chinese undersea warfare, um, and boy, is there a lot going on. Um, I'll talk though a little bit more about the military balance, and, and my assessment of the military balance, we may uh, disagree on a few things, but I mean, it, it is a powerful part of my, um, my thinking. That is, I come partly to the conclusion that one reason we should try to get along with China is uh, that the, um, how to put it, um, war with China would, would not be a cakewalk. <laughs> uh, far from it. Uh, it would be extremely destructive and our losses would be uh, very high, as with theirs. But uh, so, you know, we need to be, it, it forms a background for these uh, diplomatic discussions, of course. So you've heard a lot about the uh, Chinese missile capabilities. Uh, these, uh, of all China's military capabilities, these probably get the most attention generally, and, and uh, maybe some of you have seen this very disturbing graphic. Um, I don't actually know the origin of that graphic, but what they're talking about, of course, is that revolutionary capability that my uh, colleague Andrew Erickson, for example, has done a lot of work on the uh, so-called anti-ship ballistic missile. And if you're following the, that famous parade that took place in September, the Chinese actually revealed yet another uh, missile of longer range, uh, same idea though. Uh, so. Um, you know, th this is, I think, a major threat that, the, that we're taking quite seriously. Now, uh, uh, but Chinese uh, military naval development goes way beyond that. I mean, they are playing around with these kind of expeditionary capabilities, and you all know very well that there aren't too many navies in the world that can, you know, that are proficient with these kind of um, amphibious capabilities, for example. Um, and here's, here's an example of kind of China you know, beginning to, in a kind of modest way, to throw its weight around. And, you know, interesting that this was front page news on Global Times that uh, for the first time ever, this was in, uh, let's see, September 2014, the Chinese fleet had, had uh, entered the Persian Gulf in, uh, as a squadron. So, um, you know, that, that qualified as big news in China. Uh, but just to share a little more of the kind of work we're doing, in, uh, in our institute, for example, uh, here I, I did some work, for example, on um, Chinese undersea sensors, a kind of Chinese SOSIS system. And uh, we were able to uh, reveal using uh, dozens of sources that uh, indeed a uh, Chinese SOSIS system is, is definitely uh, exists and, and uh, is expanding. So this is important, something to keep our eyes on. And just a little more on the military balance here. The, as I read the uh, Chinese discussions about undersea warfare, you know, they're very concerned about, for example, uh, you know, al allegations of, uh, of American submarines off their coast, uh, watching them carefully and, and watching all their, uh, you know, as they move in and out of port. Uh, it's something they're very concerned about. Uh, uh, one area I've looked at a lot is, is mine warfare. Here's a kind of typical 
uh, piece we see in our institute where they're talking about um, uh, where this is a um, professor from their submarine academy and here he says you know actually mines are the most uh, submarines are the most ideal method for laying mines and so forth so you know th this is a major concern and I actually have a piece I just wrote up on the national interest where I discussed this interview for example um, uh, but, and I would emphasize that China, you know, some of its military development is not so glamorous, of course, you know, I mean, these are kind of workaday frigates. Um, and yet we know that in the military balance, these, uh, you know, I, I call this uh, crossing, they're crossing their T's and dotting their I's, right? You need these, you know, sometimes these are the kind of vessels that make, you know, turn the tide. Uh, and um, they're moving ahead in other areas, you know, this is an area they've been extremely weak, that is uh, anti-submarine helicopters. Uh, so we often say China, this is China's, the, the Achilles heel of their Navy, and yet um, I see a lot going on here, and I think the next 10 years are going to be pretty interesting in this area. And by the way, I just, you know, you may be interested that ONI published a report about, um, I don't know, six months ago, kind of definitive type report about where China's at, but neither of these two helicopters were even mentioned in the report. So what I'm saying is that we need to round out the intelligence assessments with just, you know, reading uh, regular Chinese publications. For example, this is a cover story, uh, so you'd think we would want to be paying attention to that. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to criticize. It's a very hard job to get our hands around everything going on, but uh, we have to... I'm going to skip this one. The submarine uh, looks just like a USS H-60 helicopter. Yes, yes, absolutely. Like identical. Yeah. It is identical. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> undoubtedly, undoubtedly. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's not a threat. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> in fact, that may mean it's more of a threat, of course. <laughs> you know, those of you who know that helicopter know it's, there's a reason they're copying it, right? It's a good helicopter. Um, okay, well, by the way, we sold them Blackhawks in 1980, so we shouldn't be surprised that they like the Blackhawk. <laughs> they like it a lot, actually. Um, all right, well, let's, let's talk some about the, uh, what is the, um, tone of the discourse in the United States about um, what to do about China. And here you see, uh, I think, Admiral Harris's remarks made big headlines. And, and uh, we'll talk more about these, uh, uh, these reef building effort that's ongoing. Um, here's my colleague, uh, Jim Holmes. He's probably stood up here many times in front of you. Uh, you know, there's a lot of concern, and you see it in his writings. Uh, here's something from the Wall Street Journal, uh, Ratner. You know, let's counter Chinese aggression. Uh, here's one. I, I, I can't say I like this kind of headline, but it, it, I, I say that in particular because I, I write a lot in the national interest, so I've told their editors, you guys got to rein it in a little bit. Um, uh, but indeed, you know, I think 10 years ago or 20 years ago, we did not have seen this kind of headline, you know, as a regular, you know, it's not even shocking these days. And part of that has to do with just, you know, sort of the profusion of bloggers and all this kind of thing that's going on. But I, I do think there, we have now become kind of accustomed to, uh, you know, it's, it's fairly normal to talk about war with China, uh, which is, I, I find personally very, very disturbing and, and was part of my motivation for writing the book. Okay, now I want to share some insights from the Chinese uh, discussions about where the relationship is at. And please um, forgive me for, for uh, dragging you through lots of slides here, but I, I do think you know, when we say, who, who is a China specialist after all, it's important to, to show our evidence. You know, why do we think the Chinese think certain, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to check the time here. Where, ah, okay. I don't want to uh, drone on too long. Now, this is, uh, this is uh, from uh, 2013. It's a journal called Tsai Jing, which is sort of the Chinese version of The Economist. And uh, I was quite disturbed when I read his, you know, this uh, Chen Shiqing's appraisal of uh, Chinese economic and trade relations. You know, the, the tensions in U.S.-China trading, in the trading relationship are intensifying on a daily basis. Uh, and, uh, you know, the U.S. obviously rejects the idea of inviting China into the TPP. That's in the news a lot. So, you see these economic tensions, you feel them in the United States, you know, actually it was being discussed before we started. Uh, they exist in China too. Uh, in fact, here's a Chinese general uh, at their um, National Defense University, and you can see the kind of things he's saying. Uh, you know, look at this, for example. I'll just read it in case anybody can't read it back there. Uh, to serve the demands of the U.S. market, we have exploited our resources, ruined our environment. Was that in our national interest? I mean, it, it is kind of, you know, 
economic nationalism, just a sense that, that uh, China has not been well served. Uh, but moreover, you know, the, you know, one cannot escape the conclusion that we confront a mighty opponent, the United States. So, uh, you know, when a general, a Chinese general is talking this way, um, it's, um, it's quite disturbing. And what I'm getting at here is this kind of, I, you see it in the United States too, that is a mixing of economic concerns with national security concerns. And I think they are both uh, kind of uh, fusing and feeding on one another, uh, and that's disturbing. But let's turn d more closely to what Chinese military people are saying. And this is Admiral Hu. Uh, he had just retired when he gave this interview. <coughs> this is a couple years back, but I think it's, I remember when I read it, I was sort of like, whoa. Because I've been reading this for, you know, going on two decades, I've been reading these sources, and I've not found this tone before. Very, uh, you know, you can read, well, I'll just read this quickly. It says, the United States as the fundamental anti-Chinese force may seek to precipita precipitate a crisis, hoping that internal difficulties could fil facilitate foreign aggression or that foreign ag aggression could cause internal anxiety. So you see there kind of a fusing of concern about what's going externally in China, but also what's going internally in China. Um, and uh, here, this is even more disturbing, I think. They're talking about building the legal basis for the use of, of non-peaceful means to resolve the rivalry over maritime rights. Okay, non-peaceful means, that's, that's a little bit subtle, but not too subtle, right? Uh, we know what that means. Um, here's, I watch, a, I watch a lot of Chinese news. Uh, you know, anyone who mistakes China's good intentions for weakness or views China as a paper tiger, he's absolutely wrong. And, and uh, so you, this is becoming more and more common, and, and I think I would say, just as our discourse has become much more hawkish, so has theirs. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip that one. But now this is something quite disturbing. This is fairly recent, about a year ago, in a very important Chinese journal. And uh, this professor from uh, Peking University says, actually, owing to the asymmetric nature of the combat theater, the Chinese Navy will undoubtedly possess a force structure advantage in the near seas. That's quite new, okay? In all the years I've been going to China and I'm on my way in a couple weeks, I have not heard Chinese analysts say these kind of, like, we have the, adva we have the military advantage, okay? Uh, and this is a high quality journal. So, you know, and there are caveats on that too. Is it, I don't want to, uh, I'm not trying to overhype this. It's just that you, you sense this, uh, this greater confidence. <coughs> Here's, now this uh, strategist, his name is Zhang, Zhang Wenmu. He's quite famous in China, but he, uh, He's kind of a hawk's hawk, as it were, in China. And, and so, but he's saying, you know, look at what Putin did in Crimea. We can do the, you know, we the Chinese, we can do the same thing. Uh, so it's quite disturbing. And uh, this article, for example, got a lot of play. Um, I'm gonna skip that one too. But let's, you know, just think about how these issues are portrayed. This was from uh, last spring when uh, Secretary Carter went over to the Shangri-La Dialogue and uh, over to the Philippines and, and you know, the headline in China on the news is uh, the U.S. is about to set up eight new bases in the Philippines. So, uh, again, you get the sense of uh, real hawkish uh, sensibility now in China. Um, and <coughs> now this I also found disturbing. This is just a few, this is in 2015. Admiral Yin, I actually met Admiral Yin uh, about a year ago. And uh, he says something quite similar to that Peking University professor. He says, uh, if in the future there's a conflict between China and the U.S., it will take place right on China's doorstep. And to put it rather bluntly, China doesn't fear any country if the fight's on our doorstep. And, you know, as a military strategist, you hear that and you say, well, he, he's right. I mean, in other words, they have a huge, you know, some, some pretty important advantages if the fight is right on their doorstep. Um, Back to the military balance for a second. Now, this is a YouTube video. You can go and watch it at home or on your device right here of a YJ-18 hitting a, um, a ship in a test. Uh, it's pretty disturbing. And um, now, we talked about some missiles earlier, the anti-ship ballistic missile. But this is a cruise missile, of course. And, uh, you know, again, I think I mentioned that uh, we, we don't have a supersonic cruise missile in the U.S. Navy. Uh, we're, we're working on one, although actually I think the program was canceled. I think that was the El Razan B. You know, this is disturbing. And, and I find that, you know, the people I are the best experts are our students, of course. And I ask my students about this and they say, yeah, you know, we're, we're outsticked. So there's a lot of concern. Uh, not to say we, ha we have other capabilities, of course, but a submarine force, for example, 
And here's a Chinese analysis, and you, you can find a lot of this kind of discussion saying, gosh, the U.S. submarine force is going to come down all the way down to 41 boats. In fact, I heard lower even. Uh, and the Chinese are tracking that carefully. So they, you know, know where our potentially, where our weaknesses are. Um, <coughs> there's another kind of dramatic example of what, how the Chinese think about the problem. And you can see here the uh, missile launchers over here. This is the cover of a technical journal that we get at the Institute. And I actually, the, the guy who pointed out to me is back there, uh, Martinson. He's a great China expert in the back. Um, it's kind of striking, though, uh, how now they're so, you know, they're very proud of this anti-ship ballistic missile, it seems, and um, so proud that they're putting it on the front of their, uh, their journals. And, and, of course, the primary problem is how to track that fleet, and I think they're working on that, uh, how to track our fleet, that is. You know, in the interest of time, I think I'm going to skip these two, but, all right. <coughs> I think I'm going to, let me get a sip of water here, but I, I'm going to change directions a little bit here for this, uh, for this um, next part of the talk here and share with you some. Um, now, I, I laid out a real dark picture there, right? I mean, there's a lot of tension on both sides of the Pacific. Um, it sort of looks, seems like both countries are, are, you know, girding in earnest for conflict. Um, but I want to suggest that uh, we have to take a, a larger view, a more balanced view, and see that China actually is doing a lot uh, uh, a lot of good out there, and we, we want to make sure that that is considered in the ledger of how we think about these things, okay? Not, you know, in fact, no other country has built a purpose-built hospital ship, okay? And the hospital ship, um, you know, you can call it a kind of propaganda tool or whatever you want. We, we do a lot of uh, uh, military medicine around the world, and, and I think a lot of good has been done. So uh, I don't think we should dismiss this uh, kind of capability. And uh, there's much more to it. <coughs> the, uh, China has been very active with blue helmets, that is UN peacekeeping, going in some real dangerous situations. They've gotten people killed, for example, in Lebanon. And uh, that's a pretty tough neighborhood, as you know. And more than that, they're doing a lot of training of blue helmets, which is absolutely essential. I mean, that's a, everybody who studies blue helmets, you know, UN peacekeeping knows that training is kind of the biggest problem. Well, they have the most advanced training center in the world. Uh, right outside Beijing. It's, it's very impressive. Um, and, you know, just to give you a good example, and this picture is a little bit inaccurate, but um, I, I've looked at China's, what the China did during the Ebola crisis. Uh, that was last year, right? Remember we were reading those headlines, you know, it seemed like, you know, the end of the world, or at least the end of West Africa. Right? Really scary stuff. And we, we sent a lot of people in. Well, China also sent a lot of people in. In fact, probably you know, I wouldn't want to put the measures, the, the effort side by side, but China's effort was very impressive and quite on the scale with ours. Um, and so this is a good thing, you know, this is what we want, this is how we want China to behave in the world, and indeed they're, they're doing a lot in Africa. Uh, some of it bad, but a lot of it good, actually. Um, I got a whole chapter, by the way, in the book on, uh, on Africa. By the way, there's another chapter in the Middle East, and how U.S. and China can cooperate in the Middle East. And I would just, one more thing I'll say on that is, there are not too many China books that have an entire chapter on the Middle East, okay? But the, here's one for you. Uh, so that's somewhat unique about it. Now, who's this guy? Maybe some of you are sitting in the room when this photograph was taken, but that's, that's Wu Shengli, the chief of the Chinese Navy. And uh, that was a big historic moment last year when he visited Newport. I happened to be in China at the time, so <laughs> I didn't get to meet Admiral Wu. But it was, it's something that I've worked for, actually, really, for more than a decade. So I was very happy that it happened. What I'm getting at, though, is the Chinese Navy, uh, you may have a lot of issues with them. Of course we do. And yet, you know, uh, they are reaching out. They are, you know, participating in something like the International Sea Power Symposium. And if I'm not mistaken, Admiral Greenert, who is stepping down, of course, or just stepped down, but um, if I'm not mistaken, Greenert went to China four times last year, okay? Well, that should give you an idea of the priority of kind of military engagement. And the point is, as we're reaching our hands across, as Greenert has done, uh, they are reaching back, and I think we've got to keep that in mind, as suspicious as we may be. Now, I'll just show you a couple more examples. I hope these, I'll hand out Advil after the talk, because I know you people are probably tired of looking at slides already. Uh, but this, this um, there are some very brave voices in China standing up saying, wait a sec, you know, we, don't, we do not want to go to war with Uncle Sam. Um, here's an example, another Peking University professor, he says, now, in our country, there's a belief that border questions can only be resolved through war. And he goes on to say, that's really stupid. Uh, and he really takes issue with his colleagues. In fact, he relies on some research 
by a, a Boston um, based professor named Fravel. You may have heard of him. He's very big in our field. And he, Fravel wrote a book saying, actually, if you look at China's behavior in various disputes, they're actually quite inclined to negotiate. He says, in almost every case, they have negotiated successfully. Um, and he goes through all these cases here and explores them. So anyway, th this Chinese professor is using Fravel's work, just as I do actually, to say, actually, China's record here is pretty, pretty impressive on negotiating uh, territorial issues. So that should give us confidence. Here's another, um, say, dissident voice in China saying, calm down, we, don't, we, we can't let these uh, issues lead us toward conflict. So Shri Hong, he's quite famous, he says, says look, that, that island dispute, that's not the sum total of China-Japan relations. There's so much more to that. Okay, so the, what I'm trying to tell you is there are a lot of reasonable voices in China too, uh, many. Uh, this uh, kind of article is pretty common. If you read the title here in English, it says, uh, uh, China-U.S. Global Strategic Interest Compatibility and Their Cooperation in the Middle East, okay? And then he, la he lays out all the Chinese and American interests side by side and shows, guess what? There's a lot of er things we agree on in the Middle East. Uh, f foremost among them, you know, both countries uh, <coughs> are uh, standing up against uh, radical terrorist, terrorist uh, networks. Um, and here's one more of this variety, uh, another Peking University professor. You can see I, I spent some time at Peking University. They, they really are one of the best uh, <coughs> universities in China. But here's um, Wang Yizhou, so somebody who has very interesting views, and he says, look, China has not produced the public goods, the, in Chinese, the gong gong champion, uh, but needs to. China needs to do, he's basically saying China needs to do good in the world, much more than it's doing. And he actually, at one point he calls China a lame colossus, okay? So he's very critical. And this is not a minor player. I mean, this is one of the biggest players in Chinese foreign policy standing up and saying, we are not cutting the mustard. We need to do better. Uh, and by the way, when he called China a lame colossus, he was talking about North Korea. He's saying, this is our neighborhood. We can't even, you know, we can't even run it effectively. So there are a lot of Chinese who want to reform Chinese foreign policy in more positive ways. Okay. <coughs> now, uh, i uh, kind of droning on and on here, but uh, you're, you're probably saying, you promised some specific recommendations, and yes, I will, I will give you some right now. Um, this is what you've all been waiting for. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, well, you look at this picture. This is a very common kind of thing you see in China. In fact, I'm going out to uh, Shanxi province in a couple weeks. That's, China, that's like sort of uh, West Virginia of China, the, the coal country, in other words, and you've you got to wear a mask. <laughs> it's, it's, it's terrible. But, you know, the global warming question is not a minor one in U.S.-China relations. In fact, you can argue the whole success of these negotiations coming up in Paris depends entirely on U.S.-China relations. That is, you know, can our leaders uh, come forward with some kind of plan hoping that the other countries, India and Brazil and so forth, will fall in line after the big two uh, sign up. So, there is a chapter on the environment and, and global warming, and I do consider this a very important issue. In fact, so important that I would argue that we have to be very concerned that smaller issues maybe even some, some reefs and rocks discussion can inhibit cooperation on uh, global warming. I've, I, in the book, I present some evidence of that type. In other words, that is, you know, they take the attitude that we're trying to contain them in the South China Sea, and they think that on the global warming front, we're also trying to contain them. In other words, using the global warming uh, issue to, you know, try to create uh, limits on the Chinese economy and so forth. So you, you have this line of thinking in China, I think it's very um, deleterious and um, we have to uh, work to mitigate that. All right, <coughs> well, you're saying, what is the, the actual compromise? And I can't go through every step here. I'd like to, but I can't. Uh, time doesn't permit. But the final step, you know, as it were, the grand bargain I come to, and I have one of these spirals in every chapter, that is, I have ten of them. This is, this is one. Uh, I say, the United States has to embrace a per capita emissions um, standard, and we've actually come a long way toward embracing that. So I don't think that it could be that hard for us. Uh, but maybe har a harder step is China has to then go into the uh, treaty process. That might happen, but, and they have to accept intrusive verification uh, procedures. Okay, that's tough. It's going to be hard. But I don't think it's crazy. I mean, if you read the New York Times yesterday, I had a front cover article saying that China has uh, information on, the, um, on their coal burning is not correct. Okay, so of course, you know, they can say all this wonderful stuff about what they're doing in global warming. Do we believe it? 
Probably not, and we shouldn't, okay? We need to verify, all right? So, um, so this is the kind of more, uh, a better way to go. Uh, and I think, uh, but I don't think uh, this is pie in the sky. I think we could get there. All right, now you probably wondering about those rocks and reefs <coughs> because that has been dominating the headlines. So let me suggest a few thoughts on that about how to uh, reach some kind of compromise there. And again, I'm, in the Q&A perhaps we can walk through the steps, uh, all the steps, but um, let me just share a couple. <coughs> China has been building a giant base on uh, Hainan Island to have a huge cave complex there, for example. It's creating a lot of mistrust. Um, couldn't they open it up to uh, visits from the ASEAN states to, uh, you know, in other words, allow some more transparency in what they're doing down there? Could we reduce our surveillance missions? I think we could. Uh, in response, and then could China clarify its U-shaped claim? By the way, you see I've written all this stuff in Chinese too, so the Chinese readers can, can grapple with this as well. Um, Yes, I, I think they, they actually some evidence they're starting to clarify those claims. Uh, they need to clarify much further, absolutely. Uh, and then could we endorse China's claim, not as the only claimant, but as one among several claimants? Yeah, we could do that. Uh, and could we support a bilateral negotiating framework? Yes, I think we could. And we could talk about uh, that for a while, but my own view, you know, you don't need a PhD in political science to know that a bilateral discussion is a heck of a lot easier than a multilateral one. And you wonder why things, nothing's happening. Why, how come there are no actual proposals about how to solve the South China Sea problem? Because everybody is saying it has to be a multilateral solution. Well, you'll be waiting for the next millennia, I think, uh, for a multilateral solution. It's not going to happen. Um, that's my view, and, and uh, I think that's supported by scholarship. Um, okay, well, what about that tricky China-Japan relations? And I do not believe we will have peace in the Asia Pacific unless China and Japan uh, find a way to reconcile. But I also don't think it's that going to be that hard. I really don't. Uh, my wife is from the Middle East. Look at the Middle East. You know, people are slaughtering each other every day. That's hard, <laughs> okay? That's not happening in China and Japan relations, okay? This all happened a long time ago. But that doesn't mean you can ignore it. It doesn't mean you can put history aside. I think history is very important. I would urge you to look at some of the new uh, works that are kind of an, uh, of an objective nature. Here's a great history by um, Rana Mitter. Uh, he's at Oxford. You know, take a look at that. Uh, if you don't know who John Rabe is, you should. You've got to learn about what happened in China during the war. Google it, or we can talk about it in the Q&A. It is a very fine German movie, not a Chinese movie, not a Japanese movie, a German movie about this guy who was in Shanghai, uh, sorry, in uh, Nanjing in 1937. Check it out for yourself. Um, <coughs> So, so you're getting my, my point of view. My, my point of view is that you can't put history aside. You have to deal with it in a kind of frontal way. Um, and that's part of my spiral with China, Japan, and the US, this, this triangle, which is so difficult. Uh, I think we need a Japanese prime minister to go to Nanjing. I call that a kind of Willy Brandt moment. Some of you may have remember that from your Cold War history. That was a huge moment. Uh, and could China, you know, eventually, through steps of compromise, support Japanese membership in the UN Security Council? I think so. I think that would be very good for everyone, for China, for Japan, and the US. Okay, um, one last spiral I'll share with you, and this is, on, this is my final chapter, the, the kind of la larger picture, and I talk about, you know, how the United States could get more serious about cooperation with China if we kind of amend some of the legislation related. We can talk about that. Um, <clears throat> and the holy grail, I think, for China would be military budgeting transparency. Now, they're a long way from that. But I show evidence in the book, for example, they're discussing it. In some of their military papers, they're saying, hey, transparency is coming on acquisition, military acquisitions. We've got to be like a normal country and share this information. Okay? So China, we know where China needs to go. Uh, and I think they can get there if we keep pushing. On that. Now, um, I'm almost done here. Let me check the time. I, I know I've been talking your ears off and, and there are probably some questions, but uh, grant me uh, two or three more minutes. But uh, I'm not a huge fan of the rebalance, as you may have gathered. Um, you can read my argument in the final chapter of my book. Uh, <coughs> just, I'll just underline a few points. I think it vastly intensifies Chinese anxieties. 
Uh, you know, I'm somebody who reads the Chinese press all the time, watch their news, and it's, you know, it's pretty disturbing. Uh, the, the level of anxiety there is very high. Um, I'm a realist. I care about the global balance of power. But I don't think, uh, my own view, rocks and reefs don't have a lot to do with that. That's my view. We could, talk, we could talk about things that do impact the global balance of power. They're out there, but it's not about rocks and reefs. Um, now, then there, there, to me, there are immense opportunity costs of these rising tensions. And here I'm talking not just about global warming. I hinted at that. Well, look at the Korean Peninsula. I mean, uh, well, China and the U.S. need to cooperate on the Korean Peninsula. And yet we're in this, uh, this kind of horrible blame game where you know, China blames us endlessly for the tensions, and we blame China for not, you know, uh, getting it done. Um, and, and there's been no progress, okay, on that front. And that, that's a fail in U.S.-China relations, big fail, and for global security, okay, of, of greater importance than reefs and rocks. Um, and there's no mechanism for controlling the rivalry. You know, uh, I mean, you know, we have had that Sunnyland Summit. That, I think that was where we need to go, a good start. I could talk more about that. But you know, there's no kind of uh, institutional way of dealing with the tensions that we're seeing uh, cropping up everywhere. So it's, it's pretty scary, folks. Looks like a Cold War in formation. Uh, this is my last slide. Um, I'm often asked, I think folks in this room will know this book well. I'm glad about that. Um, I'm actually working on... Uh, an article where I'll argue that this is the first book that students of U.S.-China relations should read. Um, it's sort of the, as you guys know, it's, it's the good, the bad, and the ugly. It has the, the very worst of cultural interactions between Americans and Chinese, but also the very best, okay? But it teaches us that, you know, U.S.-China relations did not begin in, in uh, 1979 or 72 even. Um, we've been interacting for China, with China for a very long time. Um, uh, but there's one, one other point here is that and, you know, I'm often asked, well, which side should go first in these spirals? And I, my actually frank opinion is it doesn't really matter. I mean, you still just, it's this interactive process, right? But I, I think the U.S. should go first, partly because it's stronger than China, much stronger still. Um, uh, but also, you know, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't Chinese ships patrolling the, the Mississippi River for, uh, for 100 years after 1854. It was, it was American ships patrolling the... Uh, the Yangtze River, okay? And, it, and if you don't think that that affects Chinese perceptions, then, then uh, we need to take a trip to China together. Um, it powerfully impacts their perceptions about everything having to do with foreign policy and security, okay? So the, all that history, that weight of history. So, you know, we need to have a sophisticated view of history and understand. Uh, and I get it that those sailors were doing a lot of good out there, but read the book and, and you see. Um, you understand. Um, there, there is a legacy here to deal with. All right, uh, so that's, that's what I have to say. I guess I'll, I'll uh, one last question for you folks. This is a very unusual picture right here. It's, it's small, I know, but uh, this is uh, Chinese and American forces in not doing an exercise, actually doing an operation, a joint military operation. So uh, any guesses, a uh, suggestion where that happened? It doesn't happen very often. <laughs> Good Red guess, sea. good guess. We've done quite a few exercises with the Chinese in the Red Sea, uh, counter-piracy exercises, but this is actually very far from the Red Sea. It's a military operation. These guys look serious, right? <laughs> it's the real thing. Uh, this is on patrol in Haiti after the earthquake. Okay. But I, I make it a question for you because you realize how rare it is. And in my view, uh, in my approach, in my book, I'm advocating the, the, the world needs China and the U.S. to work together. Uh, on Ebola, on North Korea, on global, uh, uh, on global warming, on so many fronts. And so many things, challenges we're not even aware of yet. <laughs> okay? Um, that's my view. Uh, so that picture, it, that, that's what I wanted for the cover of the book, but they didn't, wouldn't grant that to me. But let me end there. Thank you so much. And uh, if you have questions, uh, I'll be uh, very interested to hear just your opinions or, or uh, questions, too. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, my, my colleague, Roger Barnett, yeah. Uh, Thanks for coming, Roger. Any interest on either side in the incidents at sea, like agreement, which was a bilateral agreement and deliberately bilateral, mm -hmm. and then other countries came in behind and made their own separate agreements with the Soviets? Yeah, that, that's a, a great point. Um, 
There ha look, there have been um, uh, several stages of negotiations with the Chinese about incidents at sea. Um, and I think in the American mind, certainly, uh, you, you've had a um, you know, fairly energetic effort. And there, are, uh, there is a, a forum that takes place every year. Um, one of you guys help me out here. It's the uh, mil uh, I'm forgetting the exact name of it. But it, it is kind of incidents at sea. What w both sides get together and we report out what are the, uh, you know, the kind of incidents over the last year. And there's some discussion. But the, frankly, the view in um, Washington on that is, is very negative and, and says that the Chinese are not seriously, they're not taking it seriously. Um, so that's a bit disturbing. And I think many of us have argued that we need to go way beyond that. Um, I just, in fact, I have a piece on national interest right now. If you go and look at it, um, it was up a couple of days ago. And, and there I was, it was going through some Chinese analyses of the INCSI agreement. And, and what it was saying is kind of disturbing. It was saying that even after the INCSI agreement, in, that was 1973, I think, uh, <laughs> 1972. So the, even after that, there were still a lot of uh, pretty, pretty dangerous incidents in, in uh, like that they were reviewing actually specifically that 1988 incident, the bumping incident in the, in, uh, in the Black Sea. So, you know, I, I, I think time, that, yeah, over, go you know, Over time, there was a cultural modification. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, ship commanders would, wouldn't even think of doing things that mm -hmm. uh, were, would fall under the incidents of sea treaty. Yeah, yeah. And I should say, I mean, I, I give our uh, Navy chief and, and the Chinese Navy chief a lot of credit because they, they came up with this, um, Cues, uh, that is a code for unplanned encounters at sea. That was just signed in, in uh, I would say, um, uh, November 2014 at the summit in Beijing when Obama was there. So I mean, that's a good start. There's there's some effort to expand that to include aircraft, uh, and as well uh, also to incru include non-military uh, vessels. You know, I'm talking about coast guards and so forth. So so there are some um, approaches underway. And by the way, you know most. Uh, uh, people who have interacted with the Chinese Navy do think that they, you know, they, they take professionalism pretty seriously. So, you know, in that sense, we may be um, encouraged. I mean, I know there have been a lot of uh, negative incidents as well, but um, it, but just just if you look at the piece I just wrote on that, and I'll, I'll forward it to anybody who'd like to look at it. The one thing that Chinese are concluding in their own analyses is how, even during the late Cold War, after the Inksi, that you still had a um, very high level of professionalism on both sides that enabled a very difficult situation like that 1988 incident in the Black Sea and yet in still it was managed in a way by by very uh, professional officers so that the incident took place nobody was hurt you know th there wasn't severe damage done and yet you know both sides got their point across you know as a way of messaging let's put it that way so one of the great advantages of course is there's a, there's a navy to navy agreement Hmm. And uh, when their incidents took place, the navies got together, either in Washington or in Moscow, to, to deal with it. Yeah. And, and the State Department, none of the Pauls got into it at all. Hmm. It was strictly a Navy to Navy professional. Yeah. Uh, so that, that, um, and that's a great advantage. Yeah. Well, I'll say, I've said it before, I'll say it again. <laughs> One um, strategic asset that the United States has here is that the Chinese Navy admires the United States Navy intensely. I mean, when you see their naval officers come to Newport, for example, I mean, they look like, you know, kids in a candy store. I mean, they're so excited. So I think that we can kind of leverage that admiration to, uh, if, if we take an attitude of like, you know, um, I don't, you know, this will sound condescending, but almost like, uh, you know, younger brother or something, you know, you kind of bring them along and realize that they're an up and coming Navy. They want to be professional. They want to learn. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of inhibitions about, you know, if we teach them this or that. But if we take an attitude of, of um, as it were, you know, kind of coaching, then I think that will help us to build a much stronger relationship. So I'm in favor of a, a pretty robust engagement with the Chinese Navy. So. Peter. In that regard, is there any prospect of having the Chinese participate in the War College classes, the NCC, the NSC? It seemed to be uh, <laughs> obvious. Yes, you know, that it's a great point, and, and uh, I really appreciate that question because it's something that I've worked uh, um, quite a bit on and been, frankly, uh, very frustrated with. And, and part of it is frustration with the Chinese side because uh, the Chinese side have put up a lot of barriers uh, to the effect of, for example, if we, have a, um, if we have a Taiwan student here, then they say they're not going to play. 
so that tends to be kind of the roadblock. Um, but uh, getting to your point, and, and um, in my view, we need we don't need one Chinese student. We need ten. I mean, in the, frankly, the same way, we, we don't need one Indian student, we need 10. I mean, in other words, there are certain uh, global navies that are, you know, as we're a cut above, that are, are really going to be of seminal importance, and we should put our focus on that. And I'll tell you, when I go outside of Newport and I tell audiences that we have a lot of students here, but we don't have any Chinese students, they're shocked. They can't believe that we're, we're doing that. Uh, so I, I do believe we've got to revisit that uh, continuously and try to get to a point where we do have Chinese officers here. Uh, we had a Russian officer here, and you know, I, I do some work on Russia, so I'm often comparing the two situations. And, but this Russian officer was, uh, was superb. Uh, I know he got a tremendous amount out of it, and he was an advocate for U.S.-Russian uh, relations uh, to a high degree and really help the colleges to start to work together and so forth. Uh, of course, it's, it's, you know, a lot of that progress is lost now, but uh, we'll really benefit from those people uh, on the inside. And, and guess what? When they come to Newport, they can't help but leave you know, quite pro-American, right? We know that, right? Because people are friendly and, and they like the atmosphere. The, uh, you mentioned the insistence on a multilateral solution, which seems to be holding back a lot of things. Yes. Who's insisting? <laughs> Well, you know, a part of it, frankly, I think is kind of a cultural disposition, you know. I mean, it's, it just has a, a ring to it, you know, that, that uh, and, and, you know, I'll, I'll say, I think the United States has played the, a bit cynically here and, and said, well, there are a lot of little countries worried about China. We're going to kind of make, we're going to carry their water and, and uh, all those little countries' interests need to be uh, supported and, and that will be the only way, you know. Uh, you know, in other words, we don't want Vietnam and Philippines to negotiate with um, China if, if Brunei is left out. Or, you know, you have this kind of attitude that is um, that ASEAN, you know ASEAN of course, uh, should be the kind of um, the lead as it were for trying to reach some kind of negotiated solution. And I, I should say they have pushed a, what's called the code of conduct. Okay, but if you look at the progress of the code of conduct, uh, especially how it's discussed on the Chinese side, I see it as a very uh, I don't think it's going anywhere. And I don't think it's particularly helpful, really. Um, so what we need are, we don't need people to say, I will not, you know, approach this ship or I will not, you know, uh, uh, act in this way. I don't think that's going to work. What, you, this is really a territorial issue uh, where baselines need to be drawn. People need to pull out the maps. I mean, the example I often use is uh, uh, to invoke the name of um, Richard Holbrook. Maybe some of you recall when he was given the Balkan problem. He said, okay, I'm going to take all these people, you know, the Croats, the Serbs, the, the um, you know, Bosnians, I'm going to put them in a room, we'll lock them in, and I'm going to bring pizza occasionally and with a bunch of maps and negotiators or mediators, and by golly, you know, in, in three weeks, we're going to have an agreement. <laughs> that's the kind of, to me, that's the kind of hard-headed diplomacy uh, with maps and so forth that, that is absolutely needed. And now China... Um, has, may, has signaled many times that they're interested in, a, in negotiating these things. Uh, and, and like I said, there's quite a long record of successful negotiation, including like they negotiated a good part of the maritime uh, border with Vietnam, for example, and that's been reasonably successful. So, you know, I think there's very good reason to believe that those negotiations would turn out well. I mean, just to give an exa another example, uh, uh, China went into negotiations with, with Tajikistan. You know, Tajik who's ever heard of Tajikistan? Uh, it's a little tiny country. And, and Kyrgyzstan also. It's a complex set of negotiations over, over, not about rocks and reefs, but about, you know, yeah, villages, you know, pasturage, you know, pa uh, uh, places where people farm and so forth. Uh, important, really important stuff, you know, to people's livelihoods. And yet, the, the, they came out of those negotiations very successfully. Uh, it took a while, but when they came out, uh, uh, you know, I think it's, I think you can look uh, at all kinds of accounts and realize that uh, these little countries did just fine. In other words, China realized that if you go around and, and, you know, push people around constantly, you're going to get a very negative result. So I think they're quite eager, actually, China is to put this behind them. By the way, most people don't know this, but that U-shaped line, I don't have a, I apologize, I didn't bring a good map. That U-shaped line wasn't dreamed up by the communists, it was dreamed up by the, uh, their predecessors, the uh, Republican government. So in the 30s. Um, to me, that's, that provides a way out, a way that they can uh, not lose face when they say this line is stupid. 
and let's let's come to agreements. Let's you know get the oil and gas out and the fish and, and so forth, and let's engage in some environmental protection. But I think we can, if you look at the details of this dispute, this you know we can solve this, sir. Is North Korea a satellite of China that they're playing us? <laughs> Uh, that's a very interesting question. I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, actually, maybe I'll inflict on you the, uh, see if I can, I did put the rest of my spirals in here. So you see they're here. Um, now, my approach on North Korea is quite unconventional. <laughs> you say my, my approach generally is unconventional, but on North <laughs> Korea, is, I, I, I felt like it was one of the most interesting chapters because I really had a different um, approach. Um, you, you said, is, is North Korea a, a what did it say, a, a, sa a satellite? A satellite. Um, I wish it was. It's not, but I wish it was. Um, if they were a satellite of North Korea, I don't think that they would play these games um, and uh, would, I don't think they would have nuclear weapons, actually. So w the problem, I think, is that they have, um, the Chinese kind of, you could say, with the Russians, they sort of pulled the rug out from under the North Koreans. They used to give them a lot of support and be very friendly. All of a sudden, in the early 90s, they were like, you know, you're on your own. <laughs> we got other things to do. Uh, fine. You know, they realized, you know, how, how to, they were called a spade a spade. That is, this, this uh, rogue regime was left to its own device as well. Now you have a situation where, you know, I think the North Koreans concluded, you know, in the early 90s that they're only uh, pro- or, sorry, in the early 2000s, that their only uh, way to survive as a regime was to build nuclear weapons. So as abhorrent as we um, may find their regime, that is the approach. So actually what I advocate for is actually kind of along the lines that you said, that I think instead of what we've been, our diplomacy has been aimed at separating China and North Korea. We've been trying to, we, um, we want China to put sanctions on. Uh, we want them to halt their trade, you know, try to screw, uh, tighten the screws on North Korea. I actually think that policy is very dangerous. I think the more you drive a, a crazy person into the corner, the more likely they are to lash out much more aggressively. And indeed, you know, we have seen some very aggressive behavior over the last few years. So I want to see a step-by-step. -step. I actually want to see a closening of the, uh, and in fact, the latest news is uh, Kim Jong-un may actually go to Beijing. And a lot of people in Washington are going to howl about that. They're going to say, oh my God, look what they're doing. I think it's a good thing. I want, I want China to control North Korea because China does not want them to have nuclear weapons, okay? So they're, let China, again, we can let China solve this problem. So how do I see this playing out? Uh, I propose a kind of, um, you know, early set of steps that are easy, um, some mill-to-mill -mill engagement. We can, we can talk about uh, the Korean War with China. I think we should do some of that history. Uh, I say China should propose a four-power uh, patrol because the, the maritime conflicts there are very acute. Um, but generally, I am looking for uh, a freeze on North Korean nuclear weapons that is monitored by China, okay? Not by the IAEA, by China. They have the capability. Most important, they have the interest. They want it more than anyone. Beijing is so close to North Korea, do you realize? I mean, and, and if you read in their publication, they're extremely concerned about North Korean nuclear weapons. If, if China could get North Korea to freeze their weapons program, could we initiate diplomatic relations with North Korea? I think we could. Okay, to try to bring them out of isolation a little bit. Um, so, you know, the, the, I think there are some kind of paradoxical ways of dealing with the Korean problem. But uh, further, we've tried isolation and it is not working. They're building, uh, working very hard on their nuclear arsenal. And I consider the situation extremely dicey. We have to work together with China on this. China cannot do it alone, and we can't do it alone. We know that. So we've got to work together. We're kind of stuck. It's like two prisoners chained together on this. Sir. So this is perhaps a naive question, but where is this Kim is, you know, he seems like a loose cannon, as it were. Yeah, yeah. And Without more rational forces, even within Korea, uh, constraining him. If he decides that he wants to take out San Francisco, hell or high water, like some of these ISIS things going after plane, I mean, can he pull that off? In other words, can he start World War III type of thing? Or I, I don't have a doubt in my mind that he could start World War III. 
you know, I, I've told people, you know, everybody's paying attention to the South China Sea situation, but it, the situation on the Korean Peninsula is much more dangerous. I mean, in a space of hours, uh, millions, tens of millions of people could be dead, including in Beijing and Tokyo and Seoul and Pyongyang. I mean, it could all go up very quickly. Is a, is a single individual can take his immediate consorts or whatever and say, hey, I want this done and they'll go do it. Yeah, I'm afraid that's the case. So uh, we have to be extremely careful with this and it's going to take some careful and very creative diplomacy. I'm not saying that we don't need deterrence as well. Of course we do. But if you look at, you just look at the numbers, folks, between South Korea and North Korea, and you actually could see why North Korea wants nuclear weapons so badly. Because South Korea is extremely powerful. You know, their economy is something, I don't know what the numbers are, something like a hundred times now the GNP of of uh, North Korea, they're superior in every uh, metric. So, you know, uh, nuclear weapons are their very last card. So we have this very paradoxical situation where the only way to denuclearize the peninsula is actually to safeguard the national security of, um, of North Korea. I know it sounds weird, but that is the only way forward, uh, I think. Now, by the way, one step I didn't talk about, and this is very strange, and here you're going to say, well, that guy's really lost his marbles. But, Think about this. What if, what if China actually had troops in North Korea? They did, right? They were there for a while. They pulled out in the mid-1950s. Uh, I actually found out why that was the case. So why did they pull them out? They pulled them out because, um, well, part of it was economic, but part of it was they, Kim was very worried that the Chinese troops would play a role in, um, you know, in the future of the regime in North Korea. Okay, so they pulled them out because they, they wanted to show they were not going to interfere in Pyongyang politics. Uh, I got that from a very uh, serious uh, historian of North Korea. So, um, but that's, again, this paradox. I want China to hold them closer. So I would like to see a re, I want, they have a treaty with North Korea. I would like them to put troops back in North Korea. Because the message to Pyongyang is China is not going to let them fold. We're not going to let South Korea take over. We're not going to let the U.S., you know, run amok, whatever. Um, that allows the circumstances where they can denuclearize. They will not denuclearize unless they get a security guarantee, more or less, from China. And China should oversee the denuclearization process. And China has a very serious interest in doing so. So, um, you know, I, I know it all sounds weird. It is, it is one of, it's kind of like one of the strangest chapters, but I feel like it's quite creative and, and maybe make some proposals. Don. I mean, just following up on that, Lyle, I mean, it makes sense from your, when you present it that way that if you also put kind of a tripwire force from the PRC in North Korea. Does right. that also tie North Korea's hands in some of their provocations with South Korea? Absolutely. Point that yeah. China yeah. would tie their hands and Absolutely. not allow yeah. them to do some things that could cause their folks that are there to, be, to come to blows with exactly. The South Korea. Exactly. And, and I think that's, um, yeah, I mean, I, I first came up with it actually, I don't know, I, you know, I've, like I said, I studied Russia in the past and thought, you know, well-versed on the Cold War and so forth. And part of the, um, I remember from the Cold War in Europe that part of the idea was U.S. troops would be everywhere throughout Europe and they would have nuclear weapons too. And, and they were all kind of trip wires and that would, um, but we were kind of all, let's say the Western Europeans were, were kind of uh, reining us in, we were reining them in, and same on the, uh, even in the Warsaw Pact. So, um, and that led to a much more stable situation, I think, than what we have now. What we have now is very unstable, and getting back to what the gentleman said here, um, where you have one kind of, we don't know even how stable he is, that is mentally even, and um, you know, he, we know he's knocking people off within the regime. Uh, and so, like I said, you don't want to push somebody like that in the corner, and China is extremely anxious to rein him in. So we, we watch this account carefully, when he goes, if he goes to Beijing, Will that lead to some kind of change? But for example, trade has been increasing be between North Korea and China. I regard that as a good thing. We want them to trade. We want them to be more secure. We want them to act more like a province, to go back to the question. Uh, there's a guy, a very famous Korea specialist named Victor Cha, and he says, you know, he kind of pounds his fist and says, North Korea is becoming a province of China. And my response is good. You know, a province of China is not going to have nuclear weapons. You know, yeah. <laughs> uh, Professor wrote. I think this uh, you know, weighing of uh, spirals of strategic trust versus spirals of strategic distrust, uh, this, is a, this is a great debate. Uh, and I think uh, that the uh, uh, coming together of uh, President uh, Ma and uh, mm -hmm. President Xi, or as they call themselves, Mr. Ma and Mr. Xi, <laughs> they uh, don't have to acknowledge any position on the state to state. But yes, exactly. That's how they're going to 
much for in Singapore this weekend. Yep, so they've been yep. willing to each uh, lose a little bit of face in that regard in order to make this happen. And uh, so I, I think that uh, uh, who knows next year, maybe it would be possible to have Chinese students here at the War College. I mean, this is uh, you know a big question if there, if there is uh, some kind of thought. I think the big question there is that uh, Ma really things have become much more stable since 2008 since he came into uh, his administration for the previous 12 years between 96 and 2008 when things were very unstable uh, but we're likely to have an administration change again in January with the with the independence party mm. elected in but the the, uh, the dialogue will already be a precedent for this president to president or Mr. Minister or Mr. De Miz as the, as the <laughs> president may be a woman yes yes uh, but uh, uh, it might be possible for, for the new president to actually uh, engage in dialogue as well uh, if, a, if a president is set. So yeah. uh, anyway, there's, uh, just in terms of this uh, analysis, that all of these spirals take something to break to make a move forward. So it seems yes. like there's yes. a little break happening in that spiral right now. It's, uh, yes, I mean, it, I mean, it's, it's, really, uh, it's really historic what we're seeing. Yeah, that's a good point. I didn't, I didn't even make the connection back to uh, could impact NWC. Of course, those of you who've been to our graduation anytime, uh, anytime really w would have noted that the only uh, military officer from a foreign entity <laughs> that is not wearing a uniform is a Taiwan officer, right? And that, you know, that is a signal, a very clear signal of our commitment to, you know, the one China principle. So, um, uh, yes, I, I think you know, this is, this is going to be interesting times uh, on Taiwan. Uh, you know, I'm somebody who, look, I think the Taiwan issue is of seminal importance. I, I purposely made it the third chapter of the book. You know, not, it wasn't just somewhere off in the, uh, in the end of the book. I mean, this is of huge importance. If you, when Kissinger was over there and, and Nixon, you know, they want to talk about other things like Vietnam, but they, by golly, they talked to Taiwan most of the time, folks. Uh, and some big compromises were made in order to facilitate uh, U.S.-China relations. So, um, you know, I think this is going to remain big. I've told uh, military leaders who always, you know, are asking about China, asking me about it, and I say, look, you know, there's a lot of rocks and reefs out there in the Western Pacific, but one of those rocks has, you know, 25 million people on it. <laughs> it's a really important rock out there, right? Um, Pay attention, okay? Taiwan has not been in the headlines, right? We, we've read nothing about it, right, for the last f seven or eight years. That's good. That's a good thing, okay? That, and, and by the way, if you look at the uh, tourists going across the strait, it's remarkable. Uh, I don't have the figures on it right on the top of my head, but mil literally millions of tourists are going. It's a huge boost to the Taiwan economy. I mean, I'm not saying there aren't negative aspects to this, too. There are some, of course. You know, every uh, sort of close relationship has positive and negative aspects, but I have said that peace has been breaking out in the Taiwan Strait um, in, in, a, in a pretty dynamic way. And we should pay attention to that and acknowledge that. And, and uh, that's a good thing. So it's not all just, uh, you know, crazy kooks in North Korea and, and uh, you know, re building airstrips in the South China Sea. There's some good news out there, too. We ought to acknowledge that. Sir. Uh, Professor, what are the long-range strategic impacts of those sand islands? What are we seeing down the line from this? All right. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, that, I think that is a question of the day, and uh, with the Freedom of Navigation Patrol, I think uh, um, you know we've seen a pretty, a pretty, um, I think, good response from the United States uh, to that development. Now, there's kind of a debate playing out, and I, I myself have been engaged in a fair amount of debating about the significance of those um, new uh, facilities. Um, um, you know, my my general view is that. Uh, is that they are not of, of great significance. Well, that, what are they doing here? What's the, what's the implication? Uh, well, look, um, you know, I think you folks above all will understand this, but um, if you go back and read Mahan or, or think about the early days of the college, uh, what was their obsession? Their obsession was the Panama Canal and, this, and the Caribbean and preventing uh, encroachments on, you know, not our territory, but our close, uh, let's call them maritime approaches. Okay, and that's exactly how China views the South China Sea. That is, um, um, you know, a lot of people say, well, they view it as their sovereignty. I don't, I don't agree with that. I think they, um, they just feel very strongly, you know, a very strong a concern uh, with this area. So the, what are those bases about? That is a, um, a reminder to all their neighbors that they're a big, powerful country. Uh, it's, a, it's a message to their own people that China is not going to be pushed around. 
Uh, it, uh, more than anything, if did anybody watch? Uh, when I was a grad student, I used to watch that show uh, Sopranos a lot. It, it's about the Italian mob. You know, there was this guy Tony, and he, you know, big, big, uh, portly gentleman who would, you know, take his cut. That's kind of how I see China in the South China Sea, a big portly power that <laughs> wants its cut. Now, how big is the cut? Uh, in any given, you know, oil or fish fishing enterprise, you know, is it does it want 90 percent? Well, that may be tough. Or does it want, you know, 10 percent or 20 percent? It's a, it's an the water, though, with all of the India and all, all these other countries, smaller countries. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. There's all, you know, everybody wants their, absolutely. And they do. I mean, unquestionably, our headlines are dominated by people saying, you know, oh, China's pushing us around uh, all the time. But uh, look, I, I, a lot of that tension, you're going to feel that tension because, uh, you know, China is growing up. Guess what? When the United States became a, a world power and a, and, a, and a great power and, and went across the continent and so forth, we also ruffled a lot of feathers. <laughs> At the times, the Canadians were very nervous and the Mexicans lost, you know, half of Mexico over it. So, you know, in other words, there's going to be people being nervous and, you know, um, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of related tensions. But in my view, we, is, we have to think about this rationally and think about what is uh, reasonable. Is it reasonable that China has a great power is going to take extreme interest in what goes on in the South China Sea? Absolutely. Um, but that does not mean that China is about to you know, either take all the resources and say the, uh, these are 100% Chinese and nobody else gets anything else. I mean, for example, we talk about, you know, this word aggression is thrown around all the time now in, in the South China Sea. Has China in the last 30 years, well, the last 20 or 30 years, gone up and kicked another power off a reef? No. I mean, that, arguably that would be aggression, but we haven't seen anything like that. In other words, they're just building airstrips on the rocks they already had. But they have not endeavored to like, and by the way, out of the whatever, 47 reasonably sized features out there, China owns like seven, okay? So there's sort of 20 owned by, uh, not owned, but occupied by uh, Vietnam. Vietnam has the most, 25 I think. Philippines has like seven or eight, you know. It, what I'm saying is, you know, at the point where China starts, you know, shoveling off or somebody off a rock here and off there, I guess at that point we can call them, you know, really aggressive. I still don't know whether it rises to a threat to the United States. Um, but that would be, of course, troubling. But they have not done that. And by and large, you know, if you look, uh, my view is a lot of this is for their domestic consumption. That is, they are trying to look tough. And folks, if you, if you think, uh, you know, American leaders need to look tough all the time, yeah, they do. You know, go watch a presidential debate. In China, it's not that different. You know, we're a big, powerful country, you know. We've got to parade our ships around and, you know, uh, make sure that they have an idea of what's going on. But there are, you know, there are serious reasons why uh, people would want airstrips there besides just uh, pushing your neighbors around. I mean, in other words, you know, the, the, the sea lanes, the accidents happen and so forth. There are a lot of fishermen out there and so forth. So uh, I do not view this as a major threat to the United States. I don't even view it as a major threat to Japan, for example. I mean, what if China were? Somebody, I got the question the other day. I was up at BU at a great forum up there and um, an eminent professor there said, well, what if they try to close the South China Sea to the Japanese? That'll, you know, be the Japanese economy will shrivel up and die. You know, I don't see that. Um, China is extremely dependent on those sea lanes too. And Japan has the capability, uh, as do many countries, to cut down those sea lanes as well. So China, China has had the ability for, for probably more than a decade to shut that sea lane if they want to. They are, they are, they are that powerful. But Japan also has the capability to do that. You know, Japan has a reasonably sized submarine force. It wouldn't take more than, at most, four or five submarines to go down there and shoot everything up in sight. Uh, you think there would be a lot of merchant traffic across the South China Sea? In other words, what this begins to look like, folks, is like nuclear strategy, okay? It's a critical maritime artery. If China tries to close it, Japan will close it. I mean, and by the way, Japan has a nice helper in the form of the United States to make sure that Japan doesn't, you know, starve and, uh, and wilt and so forth. So, uh, China is not likely to press that button, not at all. It is extremely dependent on those sea lanes. And, and, the, and look at the record. Do we see China just casually stopping ships all the time? No. Uh, they've, they've messed around with a few surveillance vessels and vessels exploring for oil and so forth. That they've done occasionally. But you have not seen, uh, you know, some kind of, as I like to joke, you know, are the Chinese going to set up a toll barrier and only let people through who, uh, you know, hand them a red envelope? No. Absolutely not. There's nothing, no evidence uh, to suggest that. <laughs> okay, yes, sir, at the back there. Okay, I'm an international student. Uh, what do you think the biggest impediment for uh, 
uh, to do a consultation with China, going from the U.S. point of view. Uh, you mentioned before the code of conduct is, does not work very well in this uh, case of South China Sea. So you better understanding about China, I believe. So what is actually the greatest uh, obstacle to talk with China? <laughs> That's a great, a very interesting question. Um, <clears throat> well, I guess I would put it this way, um, and you know, you'll you'll note that I'm somebody who thinks history is really important. But um, you know, I think it it helps to look at the sweep of history, at the decades of <coughs> history, and um, if you look at where China was, you know, 30 years ago, we look at China where where it was um, 100 years ago. By the way. A hundred years ago, there were a fair amount of U.S. troops uh, hanging around Beijing and Tianjin and all that, right? After the, in fact, go go up to Providence in the middle of the square, you see a monument to the uh, uh, Boxer Rebellion Marines, and there were a fair amount of Marines in, involved. And you can you go to the museum; you can see paintings of the uh, U.S. Marines scaling the walls of Beijing. Okay, it's pretty <laughs> it's pretty interesting stuff to look at. John will tell you, <laughs> we got whole piles of that stuff. Um, look. China's come a long way. Uh, they want to be treated um, not like just another country, but as a great power, okay? And that involves a certain approach. Uh, more or less what I'm trying to say is you have, the United States has to treat them as an equal. Uh, and we're not, you know, we're not terribly good at that. We're not really used to that. Um, we've, we've, been, we've been having negotiations with China for decades, and uh, most of those negotiations have been like, you know, we're gonna do it this way. And um, so, <clears throat> You know, China, I think, is trying to make it clear that that's not going to wash anymore. Now, for the little countries, you know, call them uh, the smaller countries around, there, there are going to be some tough, it's a tough road ahead, okay? You've got, you're living next to, you know, a gigantic country with all kinds of nationalism, with a not a particularly very stable political system. Um, it's, it's going to involve some challenges and, and accommodation. Uh, but I do think we can get there. I mean, let's not forget, China hasn't used force in 30 years. And I don't think they're that really eager to do that either. Because they know if they were to kick around Vietnam or, you know, Philippines even, uh, that would have tremendous cost for China. Uh, tremendous uh, Chinese diplomacy and so forth. So uh, they're not so eager. Uh, and I think they're looking to compromise. Uh, but uh, you want to, you know, to, to be a little bit trite here, you we need to grant them face, okay? This Philippines tribunal uh, issue, right? The Law of the Sea Tribunal. Does that grant China face? Absolutely not, right? That's like rubbing their nose in it, right? I mean, that is probably the most humiliating thing happening to Chinese diplomacy in the last 10 years. What kind of reaction do we expect from that? Very hostile. <laughs> and that's what we're getting at, folks. So, I mean, we need to change our approach a little bit, uh, you know, in the direction of kind of a, a more win-win situation. There's no alternative, really. I mean, uh, look at the conflict scenarios. They're just too dark to contemplate. So, uh, you know, I think people who look seriously at the military balance uh, and at Chinese diplomacy realize that um, uh, we need to seek for, uh, you know, diplomatic solutions. <laughs> so I guess uh, let me, shall we end it there? Thanks for coming, everyone. I'm, I'm just here, so we